huge wave of creativity riffing off of these original posts followed. More pictures appeared, including the photoshopped cave painting and hybrid that I showed you earlier, as well as pieces of short flash fiction of the type known as Creepypasta, which placed Snowman in a variety of historical periods. One of these stories told as a field report from a World War II military unit called Optic Nerve, which supposedly hunted paranormal entities, first established this idea that Snowman could be killed. And several former members started to report, whether truthfully or not, that they began to have nightmares about him. For example, this. the Slender Man came to me in a dream and told me that he existed between everything and nothing, and that time and matter are like toys. Then he broke into time judgment things and swam into the water. <laughs> By the first ten days, two major developments had appeared which shifted Slenderman from being just another brief internet fad into something a lot more wide reaching. The appearance of the first of many video series about Slenderman, called Marvel Hornets, I'll come back to that in a moment. And the first time that Slenderman was described using a word that would become deeply associated with Tulpa. The first mention of Tulpa on the Sunday of the Threads. Came a mere eight days after the initial search of post from the Museum Soki, who said, Has anyone thought about the possibility that we are creating a problem? It's a thought form that is realised through the efforts of all people. We might be creating the same, making him real. The Toronto Society for Psychical Research did this with an entity called Philip in the mid 1970s. There was a group, a book written about it called Country Mark Philip. He was a fictional person, knowingly created by the group. It was not fun games until Philip started to take on the mind of his own. Philip became real, as far as any paranormal thing could be said to be. So take all this was a big grain of salt. They went on to say, how long until there was agreement of what Slender Man looks like? When will he have a specific MI? Can the hidden, superstitious heart of the Son of Orphan Goons readers, gives Slender Man an independent existence. Think about it, a few hundred or even a thousand goons all looking at the pictures, creating the stories. I find myself looking at the shadows, imagining how they might fall together to show a lurking Slender The Slender Man pulls so many primal strings, his longest to our eyes, the hair on the back of our necks rising the subconscious. No, 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 no. Bursts across the imagination. He drags the monsters out of the back of our modern minds. He is a very satisfactory boogaloo, pressing all the wrong buttons. Even if we don't really believe in the supernatural, even if our rational minds laugh at such an insanity, we are cutting him out and sewing him together and stuffing him with nightmares and unspoken fears. And what happens? When the pictures are on the photoshops. The term Tolpa was first used in the West in 1929 by the writer Alexandre de Mion, who was a remarkable the world traveller, an enthusiastic student of Tibetan Buddhism. She eventually reached the rank of Lama and had very few more to do so. During her studies, she heard from the teachers of the practice of creating Tolpas, which is a traditional Act of worship in Tibetan world machines, and she decided to create one of her own. Rather than using a traditional figure to imagine, she chose to manifest an entity who, the sound of it, could well be based on fire time. This is how she describes the creation and the to banish it of her top. I shut myself off in the sun's meditative seclusion and proceeded to perform the prescribed concentration of thought and other lines. After a few months, I found a monkless form. His form would eventually fix and lifelike. Though I lived in the open, riding on horseback for miles each day, the illusion persisted. I saw the fat top. Now and then, it was not necessary for me to concentrate for him to appear. The phantom performed various actions of the gun, but a natural for travellers that I had not commanded. For instance, he's walked, stopped, looked around him. The illusion was mostly visual. Sometimes I felt as if a room was likely rubbing against me, or once a hand seemed to touch my shoulder. The 
features which I had imagined when building my fountain gradually began to change. The fat chubby cheeked fellow who would be me, whose face seemed vaguely <coughs> sly, malignant look. He became more troublesome and bold. In brief, he escaped with control. Once a herdsman who brought me a present of butter saw the top of my tent and took it for a living month. I also let the phenomenon follow its course, but the presence of that unwanted companion began to protrude on my nerves. It turned into a day nightmare. So I decided to dissolve the phantom. I succeeded, but only after six months of hard struggle. My mind creature was tenacious of life. There was nothing strange in the fact that I may have created my own hallucination. The interesting point is that these cases of materialization. Others see the thought forms that have been created. The second development of mention of the appearance of the YouTube video series Marble Hornets follows two days after that reference to Tolkien's. The series is part of the horror subgenre known as found footage movies, a type popularised by the Witch Project, now mainstay of Hollywood horror in films like Cloverfield, The Last Exorcism, and The Abandoned Activity Series. Although by Hollywood standards, these are relatively low-budget movies. By comparison, Marble Hornets and its descendants were incredibly cheap to make. The first season of Marble Hornets, some three hours of footage, only cost three hundred dollars a minute. It all began as a something awful post from someone calling himself Jay, an amateur filmmaker who worked on a low-budget projects, typical of these large student and naval gazing affair about somebody goes to college, come back home, everything's changed, but somehow. <laughs> <laughs> this project had been suddenly abandoned by its director Alex. When Jay talked to Alex months later about why the tape project had been abandoned, Alex gave Jay all his footage, which contained seven images of Snowman lurking in the background of the shot set. Alex didn't care what Jay did with the footage, as long as he did it a long way <laughs> Of course, once Jay started to look at the footage himself, suddenly that attention was drawn. And now, if you love the assistant can help, I'll show you two short clips from my points. Oh, it doesn't get bigger than that. It's a bit. <laughs> No, I didn't want to. Of course, <coughs> one of the major things about spending money is the way it interferes with technology. <laughs> <laughs>
moments. Long moments. Long moments went on to define a lot of ongoing aspects of stand by with us, including this symbol, which is called the operator symbol. The operator is the term that one of the is used to refer to stand by. It's never actually called stand by during the footage itself. Another aspect, of course, as I mentioned, is how technology tends to fall apart in Stone Man's wake. The um, video interference, the sound effects. Another thing that Stone Man drives its victims to do is to obsessively record their activities, which, amongst other things, gives you a convenient reason for their to be moving <laughs> <laughs> The thing about the operator symbol is that it's something that many victims are driven to just Walls with it. And it's either summoning for or protection against Slender Man. It's typical that nobody really knows which. <laughs> Many video series in the same vein appeared. Most of them brought in the same self referencing meta textual elements that have been the feature of the earlier posts. A particular favourite of mine is the series Everyman Hybrid. It first appeared on YouTube as what was pretending to be an amateur series about bodybuilding, healthcare, as just a simple kind of eating the right vitamins, that was kind of a very amateurish looking thing about big guys staying rich. Often a couple of episodes, somebody played a prank on the filmmakers by dressing up a slender man in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, led to draw the attentions of the real thing. <laughs> So then we have a story in which a supposedly fictional entity is taunted and then driven to be real <coughs> within that story. After that, the metatextual layers involved in the same way of us could even more involved. Everyman Hybrid was also significant in that it brought in deeper elements of the alternate reality gaming genre. This had been part of the whole Slender Man thing from fairly early on in some few awful threads, but Everyman Hybrid raised the stakes considerably. Ultimate reality gaming can be defined as an experience that encourages players to interact with a fictional world using the real world to do it. Players of an ARG are asked to look for clues to further the game's storyline in a variety of media, websites, film clips, and so on. Usually taking part in the exchanges of emails and other communication with those running the game with the other players. The ARG acts as a kind of filter through which the real world can be seen. The more you participate, the more you learn about the story that the game creators are trying to tell you. Players communicate by a variety of message boards who then set up by the game creators or players themselves to discuss what's going on. On these boards, an important distinction is made between discussion of events within a given storyline, which you refer to as in-game, and discussions about <coughs> how the game itself works and the people's theories about how it's going to happen and so on and so forth, which are called out of game. And these two are always kept very strictly separate. Every man hybrid hid a variety of messages in the various videos in varying forms of steganography, ways of encoding information in other ways, innocuous pieces of media, pieces of um, what's code in the soundtrack. Some of these hidden clues are to geolocated boxes. The, the, they give you a set of um, coordinates, you stick them into a GPS, you can go and find this. And they contain little sets of clues and other little hints for those who can go and follow. Obviously, kind of limited to those in the United States to go and play with that. But people who analyze the contents of these boxes are most ferocious. And the kind of people who embrace that kind of audience participation with the main gene have a lot of crossover to the kind of people who create new stories, videos, even regular plays based on the concept of Slender Man. For example, the original out of game thread for Marvel Hornets Unknown in the biggest ARG discussion board, unfiction.com, had to be locked off a few months due to its length. It reached 323 pages. Mm -hmm. 
at this time, those people were starting to get interested. There were literally hundreds of blogs that were working with very similar things. And the thing about an ARG is that it will often spiral out from its intent of the original creators, almost taking the life of its own at the hand of enthusiastic participants. One possible example of this, or the first clear instance of standing around action and appearing in the real world, came a few months after the beginning, on the 6th of November 2009, a week after Halloween, when the popular American fortune radio show Coast to Coast AM received a series of phone calls from people who had claimed to have seen and been stalked by Slenderman. This was interesting because the host had no idea, he'd never heard of Slenderman before, and that evening he had a history of calls on the subject. Most of them referred to various elements of the mythos, the kind of stuff that Marvel audits and the interviews had set up. One of the more convincing sound reports reported that she'd been dreaming of Slenderman since as early as 1992. Of course, these all could it's certainly not unknown for hoaxes to be perpetrated on a bad show. They could easily have been just tying this to one of the ARGs. But then again, maybe they did see something. Maybe Slender Man was beginning to appear or return. Certainly, many people insisted in out of game performance that they were dreaming about Slender Man more and more. Between the search, pun intended, of blocks and videos riffing off the original something of the thread and manifestations such as the Coast to Coast show. Slenderman started to leak into the world of internet. People on social media started noticing these weird little videos and the cream contestants passing on the main links. And that's when it first caught my attention. Less than a year after that initial sort of post. Now something that has always fascinated me ever since I was a kid is the way that fiction can inform magic. And I found that working with cults and, and even entities which have no known fictional origin can be at least as useful and sometimes even more flexible than a more traditional approach. My attitude as to how this could possibly work has always been tied up with the multi-model, post-modern, Taoist-influenced approach I first encountered in my teens in the works of the late Robert Andrew Wilson. I have a motto. That's <laughs> His writings in both his fictional work and his non-fiction, the distinction which of course is getting blurrier and blurrier as the evening goes on, always explored the limits of human language and symbology when dealing with what I've come to call in a professional capacity weird shit. <laughs> <laughs> as the saying goes, the Tao which can be expressed is not the Tao. Whenever we try to describe anything in particular, we try to describe magical and religious phenomena, we're trapped within the limits of our own synthesis. In a way, language and magic have always been intertwined. We talk about casting spells, books of spells are called grimoires, which is nothing but an old word for grammar. We say words have power. And as Alice Crowley once said, magic is a disease. Our mythologies, our stories, bind us. And my attitude, one shared by a lot of practitioners who could be roughly grouped under the heading of chaos magic, is that the best way to escape that bondage is to become acquainted with as many different stories as we can and the wondrous possibilities. To treat them, as chaos magic's godfather Austin Spellman said, as if they are real, not as. There are, of course, certain commonalities to any mythological symbols. Key tropes and metaphors that tend to appeal to us on a deep emotional level repeat in slightly different forms of much across most mythologies and stories. But I found that the more tales you become familiar with on that level, the more points of triangulation you have to perhaps hone in on something useful and on occasions even generally applicable. And of course, fiction has always been able to directly apply these options far better. So, for me to find this whole new mythology of tulpas and fictional beasts invading our reality was a fascinating discovery. I sat down, I watched all the Marvel Hornets all over and on high with a few of the others, and after I got over the fact that they scared the shit out of me, <laughs> I started looking deeper. Those ARG aspects, to my eyes, sounded a lot like using the same kind of temporary suspension of disbelief 
that magicians, especially the chaos variety, would use in ritual contexts. Treating the possibilities of the Slenderverse, as it came to be known, as if real. And if, as so many fans were saying, Slender Man was a Tonga, I started to wonder how could I, in theory at least, fight such a thing? Within the mythos itself, I found an entire subgenre that had been devoted to exactly that idea, and he did it in a way that really appealed to the way I throw postmodernism into my magical practice. This aspect of the Slender Man canon is called core theory. Core theory developed from a series of eventually interlinked written blogs. It was almost entirely written phenomenon core theory. There were no more videos um, that followed that part of the genre. With multiple authors told generally from the perspectives of victims and survivors of the individuals of Slender. The earliest of these was called the tutorial. It was very simple. It was a guy whose brother had been taken by Slender Man. He'd learned how to avoid it. He gave advice to keep up high. Sufficient to even if you just on the roof of a house, you can actually evade some of attention, at least in his experience. Keep moving, he said. Keep your eyes open. And so this is followed by another very influential book called Seeking Truth, which is told from the perspective of a detective named Zeke Strong, who'd encountered some man in connection with investigating a series of charm abductions that had been performed by one of Slender Man's proxies. After losing both his partner and the child under his protection, Strong decided he'd find a way to fight back and to bring others into the fight. One of his posts read, Here's my message to the people out there reading this, fighting him. I know at the end of the blog they tell you that when the time comes, that he comes after you, you should end it yourself. Take your own life so that he doesn't take it. Well, today I tell you the answer. Don't quit. Don't give up. Fight. Fight him as long and as hard as you can. He may win in the end, but don't give him the satisfaction of an easy kill. Make the fucker work for his food. <laughs> <laughs> you can't keep letting him think that just because he holds the word flush that you have to fall. If enough people fight, if enough people give him a good run around, it may be enough to finish him. The comments to both the tutorial and seeking truth soon from the writers taking all the parts of other victims who wanted to band together and fight. Many of them started blogs of their own, telling their own versions of the story. And like so many ARGs before them, the distinction between fact and fiction blurred. The distinction between in-game and out-of-game became increasingly hard to determine. Some of the commenters, seemingly not part of the actual game, taking the slender man as real, rather than as if real, shared their ideas. Some of the comments appeared to come from proxies of Slenderman. Some of them had been from the fighters, and on in the comments, and in the blogs that followed in their comments, a plan began to form. They would find a way to take Slenderman's origin as a Tulpa and turn it against him. They were going to rewrite the story. Eventually, Details of the possible approach was agreed between the UK and the writers. By taking on various archetypal identities, which they named as the mystic, the hermit, the warrior, the guardian, and the hero, the various allied block writers would form a counterbalance and force the same as influence. A suggestion was made of the time and place, the winter solstice in 2010, when Sandman would be incited to attack and be ambushed. Those who were to be in game, physically present, would be aided by the many writers and associated blogs to create an amplified scene where Slenderman would be successfully wounded, which would show that hurting the monster was possible, greatly increasing the chances for a later set of heroes to deliver a final decisive blow. <coughs> the call to arms for these writers would not be physically present in the actual battle space, which came from the character Zero of the blog A Hint of Serendipity, shows how this metatextual Aikido was planned to work. I've said before that you are the key to victory. You always have been. What I need you all to do is to simply write a story about what happened. It's that simple. Why should you do this to me? Because this is how we kill the monster. We as a blogosphere discuss, critique, and solidify a story of this event enough that we can agree and deem it canon. It doesn't matter whether it's true within it or not. 
point is that we progress further into the chain of events, advancing another one closer to killing Santa. In a literal sense, I am putting my life on the line so that you readers and bloggers can come together to give a cohesive answer to the happenings today. The event, both in terms of action in the game and the overall aspect of the addition to the overall slender man corpus, went more or less as planned. Zero struck slender with a last one below, but all involved had heavy cost. Because after all, this is long ago the story about a monster that can't be killed. A lot of writers within the Slender Man can have actually objected to call for this concept because it both lessened the power of Slender Man as a figure of terror and because it led to an awful lot of the plots changing from being about one person struggling against hopeless odds and this unbeatable horror into a kind of wish fulfillment superhero fantasy of the kind that seemingly referred to as a Mary Sue story. Nonetheless, the idea remained with me. If you're going to fight a creature made of fiction, then surely the best possible weapon to use against it would be fiction. As Crowley once said, the best way to fight an imaginary snake is with an imaginary mongoose. The more I thought about how core theory changed the stakes in the slamming of mythos, the more I was reminded of parallels between how the canon had evolved and the seeming to, at least, seem to affect reality, and the work of two comic book writers, Alan Moore and Brian Wilson. Alan's along the head. <laughs> Moore and Morrison are uh, very similar in a lot of ways, despite the fact that they've had a, I think it's 30 year feud. <laughs> They're both from working class British roots, Allen's from Northampton, Grant's from Glasgow. Both came to fame working for 2018 and then DC Comics in the States, where the work directly led to a greater mainstream acceptance of comic books as both a legitimate and illiterate art form. Both of them have more of a passing interest in the tenets of anarchism, and both are practicing magicians who have had significant encounters with fictional forms entering quotidian reality. Alan Moore is best known for highly influential comics such as Watchmen and From Hell. He first came to the attention of occultists with his creation of the comic Swamp Thing, of a character who has become the patron saint of British magicians, particularly those of the working class, John Constance, as I've ever from the culture. Based originally on Sting, not Keanu, <laughs> <laughs> and manifesting a sarcastically non-conformist attitude to both authority and the formal niceties of ceremonial magic, Constantine became an immensely popular character who's been written continually for over 25 years at this point by the very cream comic book writers, Neil Gaiman, Warren Ellis, and Brian Morrison. And Moore has said publicly that he's met John Constantine in the real world twice. This is the story of how Moore describes that first encounter, and I apologize in Bosch because there's a real tendency that when you start to read about Alan Moore, you start doing your voice. <laughs> <laughs> One day I was in Westminster. I was lost to introduce the character, and I was sitting in a sandwich bar. All of a sudden, up the stairs came John Constantine. He was wearing a trench coat, he had a short cut. He looked, no, he didn't even look exactly like Sting. He looked exactly like John Constantine. He looked me straight in the eyes, smiled, nodded almost conspiratorial, and just walked off around the corner to get the <laughs> I sat there and thought, shall I go around that corner and see if he's really there? Or should I just eat my sandwich and leave? <laughs> <laughs> I opted for the latter. <laughs> he seemed the safest. <laughs> I'm not making any claims to anything, I'm just saying that it happened. Strange rules, <laughs> probably. His second meeting with John Constantine is counted as part of Moore's theatrical performance, Snakes and Ladders which is later turned into a comic called, after the Crowley quote, A Disease of Language. Years later, in another place, he steps out of the dark and speaks to me. He whispers, I'll tell you the old 
the secret of magic? Any chance could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I had the pleasure of very briefly meeting Alan a couple of years ago, and I asked him about that second encounter. And he confirmed that it occurred within the context of a magical ritual. But under the circumstances here, that might make it more relevant to my point rather than less. A little over 20 years ago, on his 40th birthday, Moore declared that after years of studying the art of the to search his comics, he was now going to define himself as a magician. He also stated that the main focus of his practices would be the veneration of the ancient Greek snake god Glycon, who pretty much every Greek historian agrees was basically a glove puffing worked by a priest. <laughs> <laughs> a better example of postmodern worship would be hard to find. <laughs> Moore's work with Glycon led him to develop a theory of magical action and the roots of human creativity, which is a concept he calls idea space. The basic idea of idea space is that there is a parallel level of reality to ours, which is both inhabited by and the source of every idea humans have or ever will have. That the concept and characters we think we create are actually discovered. As Moore puts it, maybe our individual private consciousness is, in idea space terms, the equivalent of owning an individual private house in material space. The space inside our homes is entirely ours, and yet if we step out through the front door, we find ourselves in a street or world that is mutually accessible and open to everyone. What if that were true of the mind as well? What if it were possible to travel beyond the confines of one's own individual mind space into the communal outdoors where one could meet with the minds of other people in a shared place? This would, at a stroke, explain to me as phenomenon such as telepathy or knowledge in the distance. Moore's work continues to express this idea, especially in books such as The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and Promethea, a retelling of the Western occult tradition, featuring another uh, fictional entity who enters in reality, and a retelling of Promethea's second mongrel story. Certainly, Moore's cultural influence can hardly be said to have been lessened by his medical work especially when you consider how his very early work, V for Vendetta, has now become the very symbol of modern internet-based resistance to the status quo. See anything from it? Mm-hmm. Grant Morrison could also be said to have influenced the world far outside his comic leadership. A magician from his late teens, thanks to an uncle who of so Crowley's books, Morrison's work has always dealt with the metatextual and the surreal. In his first book, The DC Comics, Animal, Morrison ended the run by appearing in the final issue as himself, apologising to the hero for the tortures he put him through as Ben Stan readers. I love that line. We get by. Morrison's continued to explore these ideas, along with his love of the occult in books such as Doom Patrol and his groundbreaking Batman story, Ark of Simon. He also read a short introduction to Chaos Magic Tech. Especially sigil magic, and distributed it free online under the title Pop Magic. These ideas would eventually come to full flower in his epic occult conspiracy series, The Invisibles, which was one of the major influences on, and according to some, the only very slightly limited source of, a film which continues to haunt the culture called The Matrix. <laughs> the Invisibles in this story, to shorten it with the Invisible College, by an ancient conspiracy of anarchist mages who fight against the evil forces of order. In the six years that the book ran, Morrison used this battle to explore elements of urban myth, cutting edge scientific and philosophical theory, and modern occultism, but not with an underlying agenda. Morrison's explicit plan for the Invisibles was to take the concept of sigil magic and extend it into the fourth dimension, an addition which, as he puts it, develops the sigil concept beyond the static image and incorporates elements such as characterization, drama, and plot. And he called this the hypersigil. <laughs> His aim for the invisible hypersigil was both to transform society into a more gnostically inclined authority questioning state, and to shift his own persona into something more 
powerful by making the soul of the comic thinly veiled, enhanced, and ideologized version of himself. Uh, another name to Sue, if you like. <laughs> he called this character King Mon. There was an unfortunate side effect to Morrison's comic decision. During the early run of the first volume of The Invisibles, he wrote a sequence in which King Mob was captured by the enemy and tortured. One of the aspects of the torture included a dying King Mob being made to think his face had been disfigured, a hole chewed into his face by a table of virus. Morrison felt deeply ill from the Staphylococcus infection as this issue reached the print and nearly died. One of the symptoms was a secondary infection, which had a hole in his chin. However, he survived this and sensibly decided to give King Mob less of a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> and his near death experience led to a full blown vision of a Gnostic Jesus who said, I'm not the God of your fathers, I'm the hidden stone, and to break all hearts. Break open your heart, come from below, rise under the heights, descend again with knowledge. This vision before his later work, considerably more much needed optimism to both his fiction and his life. During that same volume of The Invisibles, Morrison also published a standard format sigil in the letters page, in its terms of boots, flagging the sales of the book. He asked for this to be charged by the readers in the classical technique of masturbating and sort of climax and then focusing the energy of the orgasm on the sigil itself. This spell, which became to be known in fandom as the Wankathon, <laughs> seems to work fairly well because the comic gained enough readers to reach its uh, conclusion. <coughs> After the Invisibles, Molson went on to a greater success, bringing his perspective to create her own works such as the filth and the scene guy, as well as reinvigorating classic comic book characters like Batman and Superman. The Invisibles continues to be a strong influence on pop culture traditions, to the extent that groups emulating the structure and techniques of groups of Invisibles have been created. I may or may not be a member of such. <laughs> but, back to Slender. Between more and more experiences, and my own experience with the power of fiction in relation to magic, especially with fictional creations overlapping into consensus reality, it seemed to me that Slenderman could be seen as the product of an accidental hypersigil, a manifestation directly from idea space into our space. And if that manifestation were to take a strong hold, if Slenderman became real enough to be a problem, then it would make sense to find the best possible imaginary mongers to find this particular imaginary scene. One thing you understand is the Slenderman part. This is such a key part of the canon that it really cannot be rewritten at this stage, as the eventual failure of the core figure would show. But an individual instance or construct of Slenderman, that could certainly be acting against it. My own experience in working with unwanted or occult intrusions has shown me that there are essentially three techniques or sets of approaches when dealing with the threat. The first is to simply try to oppose and resist the manifestation by whatever means you have with you within its own context, fighting it on its own self. This would mean using some of the same kind of attacks and defences that people in the standard manifest have successfully used against it. As we've seen, there really aren't that many of those. So the next possible option would be to oppose it with something that's summoned from a different mythology, which can provide a force which it can't contain with because it's beyond that mythos and symbol set. You hit it with what the lady in Banks once called an out of context problem. Preferably using an opponent with as large a footprint of archetypal weight behind it as you can possibly manage, or at least something in which you have a deep personal passion to believe. This is a technique which I like to call the Oops Batman approach. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Slendy! <coughs> Who's that behind you? Oops! Batman! <laughs> and, especially in Rob Morrison's version, Batman has a plan for everything. <laughs> this option has some merit, and you don't have to use anything quite as obvious as Batman. 
as long as it's something you're comfortable working with and has personal significance, pretty much anything can be used. That's kind of important. However, I think for Slenderman himself, the better approach would be to take the leaf out of the core theory playbook and subvert the underlying mythos itself. Especially if you combine that with a classic charismatic technique of banishing with laughter. If the internet is good for anything, other than cat pictures and porn, <laughs> it's taking the piss. The terror associated with Stan Man has always been accompanied with a certain amount of slightly sardonic humour. A couple of pitch perfect YouTube parodies on the original Marvel Hornets that idea forward. The first of these introduced Slender Man's happy go lucky lucky relative, Splendor. <laughs> <laughs> Once you've got a Slender Man, your options are fairly limitless. For one thing, he ties into one of the other popular Slender Man memes. Give him a face. Not that face. <laughs> Little to no functional difference between the actions of the group. 
who follow his hyper-real religious beliefs, and those of the more orthodox faith. The patterns of the belief are very, very similar. The amount of philosophy that is very dense in the one sheet of reality they make with their beliefs is roughly equivalent. In a world of simulacra, there is nothing more important than the symbols we use. And to quote another comic book writer, Kieran Gillen, magic is not but a symbolism weaponized. <laughs> so now, whatever it may be, isn't going well. The game Slender is immensely popular, especially considering that unlike the vast majority of first person expected games, you can't shoot it, you can't do it. All you can do is run away. The two low budget films came out called Entity and Hyro with a Y, which are featured in Slender as the main character. The more we use in our minds and possibly our world, the more we shape the game. Perhaps like another of the other imaginary themes of He'll just become another thing to provide a fun scare every now and then. He's already becoming a very popular costume option for Halloween and for conventions. <laughs> <laughs> but in trying to understand how our minds can form and nurture such a monster from the very smallest of starts, I think Slender Man can at least provide us a window through which we can perhaps better understand how our imaginations affect our perception of reality. And how this can affect our magic. I'll leave you with this quote from Victor Sage. Before, you had angels and succubi, and then ghosts and spirits. Today, we have shadow people and interdimensional beings. The Slender Man and other newly created entities are just the newest addition in a progression of a very long and very real human tradition. 